Blessings, everyone. I'm Pastor Debbie McGatt of Eastward Christian Fellowship. Welcome to the third Sabbath of Advent. I'm glad you're here. Would you please pray with me? Loving God, we give this service to you and we give ourselves to you. We ask for the profound presence of your Holy Spirit in our homes, in our hearts, and in this service. We turn ourselves over to you and we ask that you would give us your Holy Spirit to give us insight into what you are sharing with us this day. We praise you, we bless you, and we worship you, Lord God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture this morning begins with Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Let's listen for God's word. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing, as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. And at that time I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Our New Testament epistle lesson is from Philippians 4, verses 4 and 5. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Thanks be to God for this God's holy word. Now, would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Did you know that this third Sabbath of Advent has a name? Maybe you do. It's called Gaudete. And what does Gaudete mean? Well, it's the Latin word for joy. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems to me this Christmas season, joy is kind of in short supply for many. But fear and worry, well, there's plenty of those to go around. The world has been in a scary place this year, and it's not just the pandemic. It's the mistrust that's out there, the hateful divisions here at home. It's saber-rattling by China and Russia and elsewhere. And then there's our own domestic economy and rising prices, the enormous wealth gap. There are the increasing worries about climate change and the controversies about the best way to deal with it. There's the refugee crisis and our awareness of the millions of people around the world who've had to leave their homes in fear of their lives. And then, there are the challenges in our own families, financial issues and stress, serious illness, children, adults in crisis, and, and such, all of which are present in our own church, just like in any other community. So in the midst of all of this, how do we grab a hold of Gaudete? How do we sing joy to the world in the face of all this? Well, it's not always easy. And we tend to confuse joy with happiness. And happiness is directly connected to what's happening around us and to us. And of course, then when what's happening around us feels discouraging, well, sometimes we have the idea that the joy of the Lord is out of reach. But the truth is told loudly in the New Testament. Joy does not just come from our happy circumstances. 
In fact, very often it's there in spite of our circumstances. For instance, do you remember Paul and Silas in the New Testament who were very busy sharing the gospel far and wide, but they were arrested and whipped and then thrown into jail in Philippi. There they were, beaten up and locked up in the worst of circumstances. So were they cursing out their jailers? Were they in despair over their situation? What did they do with their time? Acts 16, verse 25 tells us, about midnight, they were praying and singing hymns to God. Praying and singing hymns. Actually, this seems to be a standard feature of Christian life and mission in the book of Acts. Christians get persecuted, but Christians rejoice and praise the Lord. And so the story goes on. And Christianity grew. And by the way, that jailer and his family, they were all converted by Paul and Silas's witness of joy. Gaudete, joy. In today's epistle reading, Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say it, rejoice. The theme is the same in our Old Testament reading. Zephaniah, a prophet who had been warning Jerusalem to pay attention to God's word, finishes part of his prophecy on a note of joy when he says, Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. Joy is supposed to be a major component of a life lived in Christ. If it isn't, Maybe we've forgotten something. Maybe our attention has moved off of him and onto the world and its troubles. Advent is a time for remembering. It's a call to renew our sense of wonder and joy. Advent reminds us of two things. First, that we can rejoice because of the past. We look back to that incredible time 2,000 years ago when God became a human being and came to live among us in Jesus. And second, we can rejoice because of the future. Yes, we know this is a fallen world that often seems to be going in the wrong direction, but we rejoice because of God's promise that his kingdom will come and his will shall be done on earth as in heaven, that Jesus will return just as he said, and set all things right. Because we know the past and we know the future, our future in him, we can then live in joy in the present, in the now. And when we look at our reading from Zephaniah, we discover four other reasons for this foundational sense of joy and celebration for those who believe God. First, we rejoice because we have been forgiven. In verses 14 and 15, we read these words. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. That's good news. Imagine yourself as a condemned criminal coming into the courtroom to hear your sentence passed by the judge. The verdict's already in, you're guilty. And you know you face a penalty that will lock you up, perhaps for the rest of your life. You've resigned yourself to your fate. As you stand to hear the sentence read, the judge says this, a royal pardon for this crime has been received. You are free to go and your record is clear. You're free. And why? Well, it's because of who you know, Jesus, the King. That is our situation as Christians. According to the gospel message, this is what God has done for us through Jesus. Do you believe this? Will you accept this Christmas gift that he's offering you? Don't leave it wrapped up and languishing in the corner of your home somewhere. This is the message of the New Testament. You don't have to carry a burden of guilt any longer. 
you can accept God's gift and walk away freed and forgiven. That's one beautiful reason to rejoice. Second, we rejoice because God lives among us. Our scripture says this twice in verses 15 through 17 to make sure we get it. It says, the King of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. In the Old Testament, people believed God was present with them, but in the temple in Jerusalem. They began to worship other gods and to neglect their one true God. So when the Babylonians then were able to destroy their city and take the people away into exile, the Jews thought God may have deserted them forever because of their sin, their idolatry. So verse 17 was very good news. The Lord your God is in your midst. God's prophet Zephaniah told them God's word, that God was living among them again and was willing to start again with them second chances. And for us as Christians, the good news gets even better than that. As, gos as the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14 tells us, the Word became flesh and lived among us. Or as Eugene Peterson paraphrases it in the message, the Word became a human being and moved into the neighborhood. Because of the birth of Jesus, God lives in our neighborhood, in your neighborhood. He has come among us as a human being and shared in our life. And if we'll have him, he's here to stay. He's in each of your homes right now, at all of your addresses, because wherever two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in the midst. He's not far away holding himself apart from us. He's made the decision to become one of us. And that's another reason for great joy. Third, we rejoice because God rejoices over us. He does. Look at verses 17 and 18, which say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. Did you know God is so excited about you that he sings a song of joy over you? That's what this verse says. Now for some, this may be pretty hard to believe. Some may struggle with a, a low opinion of themselves for all kinds of reasons. And it's pretty hard for us then to accept that anyone would take joy in our very existence. We may think that God could maybe tolerate us but surely not to enjoy us, to rejoice over us. But listen again. It says, he will rejoice over you with gladness. These words are spoken to God's people in all their brokenness and imperfection. And you are one of God's people. So these words are spoken to you. God rejoices over you. You've probably heard me say that God loves you more than you can imagine, and it's true. He loves you and wants to spend time with you. So this Advent, why not make time for him? There's one more thing Zephaniah shows us to rejoice about. We rejoice because God invites us to make our home with him forever. In fact, he will come to bring us to his home. Look at verses 19 and 20, which say, I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home at the time when I gather you. This prophetic message is for all of us. And it points to the truth of the gospel message in John 3.16, which we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. God invites us home. Today, many of us live a really comfortable lifestyle, and we can easily buy into the illusion that complete happiness is possible in our earthly homes, in this world as it is. Madison Avenue sells that concept. So do banks, corporations, politicians, and maybe we buy into that sometimes. But then things happen to shake us up. Maybe a loss, a crisis, an illness. Then we realize again that it's a mistake to expect complete happiness from a broken world. We were made for something better. We were made for eternity. The kingdom of God is our real home. And I think every one of us knows that, longs for it, even if we don't realize the source of our longing. It's written there on our hearts. Our real home is where the heart is, where our hearts long to be. It's where joy resides. Now, like many prophecies, there is a now and a not yet to this good word from Zephaniah. Now we have joy, knowing our sins are forgiven. Now we have joy, knowing that God lives in our hearts. Now we have joy, knowing that God lives among us and in us. Now we have joy, knowing that God rejoices over us and loves us more than we can imagine. Even the not yet brings joy, for we know that our future and the future of this fallen world are all glorious. We look forward to the day when each of us will be truly home forever, along with all those who've gone before, to the day when God's kingdom comes in its fullness and every tear is wiped from our eyes. As we wait for this day, let us continue in faith Rejoicing in the Lord always, as Paul tells us, knowing that the joy of the Lord truly is our strength, as God's word promises. So today, I wish you all gaudete, joy to all the world. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for this season of joy and for the reality of a joy in you that cannot be stolen and which is our strength. Where there has been despair, Lord, restore our joy, restore our hope, and draw us more deeply into relationship with you. We thank you and praise you for this special time of year, and we thank you and praise you for all that you have done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we now pray. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you to all of you, especially in the stewardship season, who have contributed to this ministry, for it is a shared ministry. If you choose to, um, to donate or to tithe or to pledge, you can send those to Eastward Christian Fellowship, 37 Orchard Drive, Reading, Connecticut, 06896. Or you can go to our website, eastwardcf.org, where you'll find a place to donate. And may God bless all that we offer in his name. Now, friends, if you'd like to continue this service with a, a time of communion, Eastward offers a communion service on this YouTube channel. You can find it by searching for Eastward's communion service. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and bless you this day and every day. Amen.